Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Dana Goldman. I'm the Dean of the Saul Price School of Public Policy. And I'm really excited today to be speaking with an innovator and a pioneer and an entrepreneur uh, for sustainable development. Um, Tom Zaki is the founder and CEO of TerraCycle, a global leader in the collection and repurposing of non-recyclable post-consumer waste. And we'll get into it in, in a bit, but TerraCycle is operating in 21 countries and working with over 100 brands to create national platforms to recycle products. And for those of you who, like I do, like to go for walks and have been looking at all the, the masks on the sidewalks and the other personal protective equipment, they're even recycling uh, PPE. Um, and he actually drove the launch of the first large scale PPE recycling initiative. Um, Tom and his company have received numerous awards and recognitions from organizations, including the United Nations, the Chamber of Commerce, and the World Economic Forum. And he's the author of several books, including Make Garbage Great, with a sequel coming, Make Garbage Great Again, no, uh, and The Future of Packaging. Uh, Tom, thank you very much for joining us today. Could you, I, I tried to describe your business, but it's so unique. I was wondering if you could do a better job than I did. Well, first, thank you for uh, the kind introduction and thank you all who are attending uh, today for joining the conversation. Um, yeah, I'll give it a shot. So, you know, TerraCycle is in its soul a waste management company, but we try to work in the inverse space of what normal waste management companies do, sort of like try to do what you know, others don't. And so uh, we have a number of major divisions. The first uh, focuses on how do we collect and recycle those things that are not traditionally curbside recyclable. So everything from your dirty diapers to cigarette butts and hundreds and hundreds of other waste streams, like as you mentioned, PPE. Uh, we then focus with companies on how they can start making their products and packages using waste. Um, everything from ocean plastic to the waste at the top of Mount Everest. Uh, then uh, our third division operates under the Loop brand and it's all about how do we shift from disposable consumption uh, uh, to reusable uh, consumption, but for just about anything you can imagine from clothing all the way to laundry detergent. And then we have a, 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 an innovation uh, division that focuses on how well can we um, eliminate or elevate the concept of waste? We have a lot of cool things sort of cooking there that are coming up. And so uh, maybe uh, for the audience, I mean, I'm really part of the reason I was, uh, I wanted to invite you on is, you know, recycling uh, to uh, cigarette butts and diapers. I don't want, this is a family friendly program. So maybe we'll talk about cigarette butts. How, what exactly is involved in that? And where does it go downstream? Sure, absolutely. So I think in the collection and recycling of waste, it's important to note that, you know, every waste stream uh, you should look at as almost like a unique animal. They all are animals, right? Uh, so they have similarities, but they also have uh, uh, big differences as well. So we would break a waste stream solution into three key questions. Um, how do we collect it? Uh, how do we convert it, process it? And then how do we fund the doing of the two, you know, what is actually, that's the engine and you need the gasoline to sort of turn it on. And so you, uh, why don't we compare and contrast two examples, uh, cigarette butts and dirty diapers, right? Just, uh, uh, you know, two extreme cases. The collection, say, of cigarettes, right? They're not necessarily uh, 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 hazardous as, like, say, a diaper is, so they can be out in the public. Um, people tend to be discarding cigarettes, you know, when they're out and about. So uh, uh, we uh, work with cities, now 400 cities around the world, where you can see TerraCycle sort of points all up and down the dense areas, whether it's Tokyo or Vancouver and many others. And then people, you know, when they're out on the street, would put their cigarette butts into those instead of uh, dispose them. We then, uh, would, uh, if you compare that, say, to a dirty diaper, Diaper. Um, in Holland, uh, in Japan, in France, we have live dirty diaper collection. And there, you know, it is, I mean, quite literally a shit show, if you will. Um, <laughs> so you have to worry about smell and, you know, all the other things that come with dirty diapers. So we have uh, specially uh, made smart bins uh, that you can access through your phone, deposit your diapers inside. Uh, the bins even weigh the diapers for you so you can get a little bit of incentive into the brand who's funding it, uh, in that case, Pampers. And uh, so that shows you like a difference in collection. Then when the waste actually uh, is, uh, is transported, which may have some differences as well and aggregated, 
Then our team looks at, you know, can it be reused? Now, in neither case can a, can a cigarette butt or a dirty diaper be reused. We look at upcycling. Again, not really possible in either of those two waste streams. Um, and then we look at recycling, where it's all about taking them apart. Uh, so cigarette butts, you shred them. Uh, we can separate the ash, tobacco, uh, uh, and paper and compost that and take the filter, which in that example is made from cellulose acetate. It's a form of polymer or plastic, and that's made into uh, all sorts of plastic products, like ashtrays to park benches and so on. Dirty diapers, you know, similarly get taken apart, but into very different, you know, constituents, the cellulosic material, the plastic that makes up the sheeting, and those are all recycled into downstream applications. And, and then you have to, once you have all that, right, uh, what makes something not recyclable is not that it can't be done. I mean, I just described to you how it can be done. It's that it costs more to do that than the results are worth. And so what turns these engines on and grows them and maintains them is some actor coming in to fund it. Um, could be the manufacturer. In the case of those two waste streams, it is the manufacturer. But it could be retailers. It could be other stakeholders like factories. It could be government. It could be even individuals. But we have to get very good at uh, enticing someone to take, if you will, voluntary responsibility over the waste and put their money behind that and then to ideally scale and amplify that year over year. Well, that actually, that that gets to our next question because you mentioned it's voluntary, and yes. I want to talk about the incentives to do this. And we are a policy school, and so we're we're very interested in you know how the public sector and the private sector interface here. And you know, I my background is I'm a health economist, and I come from the world of healthcare. And you know, in healthcare, we've built this large regulatory apparatus to deal with market failures. And probably the best example of that that's relevant here is the FDA, for example, which is supposed to protect us by reviewing new medications for safety and efficacy. And I guess in your world, the EPA would be an analog. Um, but what has happened with the FDA as well is that innovation takes decades sometimes to get through yeah this regulatory process. And one thing we learned in the pandemic was, you know, especially with the development of vaccines, but also even in diagnostics and elsewhere, that we had to figure out how the public and private sector would innovate more quickly. And we, and, and I think we, maybe we face a similar crisis with climate change that, you know, we're on this decades long scale, but we're starting to see evidence that perhaps things have accelerated. So can you tell me how you see the private sector and the public sector working together to address these issues? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And I would say, you know, unlike uh, the industry you were just describing, where I think the FDA is a very important and necessary gate, though, you have to get through the gate to, to get to the commercial side, in especially the waste management industry, it's sort of the exact opposite, right? Uh, you, uh, there is no gate. The regulatory bodies may come later, you know, and and uh, check in and like ensure you're doing things properly. But it's sort of the exact opposite in that in that sense. Now, generally speaking, uh, uh, what what's sort of interesting about the dynamics of say recycling uh, and policy is that the average consumer, and this is measured, will will say that the recycling systems in their community recycle what can be recycled. And almost project recycling as a public service, like uh, education or or healthcare, uh, you know, uh, or 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 police, fire, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and it actually is a false uh, understanding, and it actually I think creates a lot of false positives. Where it's you know, recycling is a private enterprise, for profit companies, and what makes something recyclable is simply kind of garbage company make money recycling that object. Of uh, you know, they have the cost of collecting and processing it versus the resulting value. And uh, most objects fall into not recyclable categories, like the ones we just talked about, cigarette butts and dirty diapers, because they cost more to collect and process than the results are worth. And as oil maintains at low prices, which it has over the past five years versus the five years prior, it, it accentuates that because all you know, plastics and raw materials are made from uh, oil and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And so the uh, it's been very much sort of a free market movement right now. And I think a big challenge too, is that, you know, the idea of solving for waste is an externality that no legislation forces on companies to to deal with at the moment, and uh, uh, that's left the you know the uh, our, our system to be much more linear than it could be circular. Now, what's really interesting in that I'd say not so positive you know uh, description is that over the it's really since like 2000, late 2017, early 18, 
it's measurable. Consumers have woken up and gotten really pissed off about the environmental topic and specifically garbage. You know, people now know what ocean plastic is and et cetera, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that's put a lot of pressure on, on regulators and lawmakers to pass uh, legislation. And it, it typically comes in the following forms. There's DRS or deposit return schemes. Those are like bottle bills, you know, where there's a deposit on a pack that you get back if you return it. Those generally take recovery rates up. There's EPR, Extended Product Responsibility, which uh, is just passed in Maine, first time in the U.S. Uh, it's likely going to come to Oregon, noting it's been you know, national legislation in many other countries for decades. And that puts a little tax on every package produced that helps fund the recycling system so that they can be more, uh, more robust. And then you're seeing you know, things get banned, like the straw and plastic bag have famously been banned in, in many places. And, uh, 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 and, and that's just you know, getting uh, more and more. And this is really helpful to uh, organizations like, like TerraCycle, which uh, is out there to innovate in ways. So all these extra measures that effectively somehow force the internalization of these externalities um, is really, really good for innovation. Uh, 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 and so we cheer them on every time they come. And luckily we're in a, we're in a climate where they're accelerating. So in another, you know, the case of, it's interesting because in the case of the bands, you're going at very specific, yes objects that you're worried about that are accumulating uh, waste. But the other examples are ones where, you know, essentially they're versions of taxes. Yes. Um, yes. And, you know, like, so for example, you know, if we think about a carbon tax, you know, or even the, the price of oil rising, as you pointed out, you know, in some ways these are very good for the environment, but they allow for companies like yourself to figure out how to efficiently allocate within that without micromanaging the waste process. Yeah, and to make three sort of builds, if I may, on that is one is uh, 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 the four bands are great because like, look, is the straw a really big deal? Is it the big <laughs> culprit of killing everything? No, you know, it's just a very emotional waste stream. But when you ban the straw, companies like your Coke and Pepsis or your McDonald's and Burger Kings, the straw is a brother and sister of their entire packaging concept. And suddenly the temperature inside those organizations right, rises because then they're like, whoa, what's next? Or what other city? Let's get ahead of it. Because corporate mentality, it's not a bad thing, is to get ahead of legislation. Then if you can't get ahead of the legislation, then partner with the legislation and move it in your direction from the inside. But the best is to get ahead of it so you can say, I'm self-regulating and I don't need to be regulated. And so uh, even threatening legislation or banning a symbolic legislation like Seattle banning straws has a huge, huge positive ripple effect to the innovation community. Taxes you know, that rise raise the price of goods, because that's what taxes do in the end, is good because look, the only silver bullet in sustainability is buying less. There's no other real good answer to the environmental crises we're in which, other than lowering consumption. And the only way to do that is to raise prices, right? So it has that benefit, which is really, in the end, the conversation we have to have. I don't think business can solve it on its own accord. Um, but it also starts the money flows. And then if the, if, once the money is flowing, the organization starts seeing, whoa, this is a real expense. Again, let's get ahead of it and do it ourselves before more money uh, needs to flow. Uh, and so there's a, a lot of really interesting uh, effects of, of this, but generally speaking, uh, uh, I'd say in the world of waste, any sort of regulation usually is, is a step forward, you know, in, uh, especially for innovators, but also the overall solution systems. I see. Um, so I, I, I wanna get, all of this is predicated on these companies being motivated to do these things. and. As you said, you know, if the calculus is such that it saves money, it's not hard to motivate them, they'll do it. The, in some of these cases, though, as you said, it's more costly to the companies yes. to do it. And we, you know, people say this companies are marketing themselves as environmentally friendly. They call it greenwashing. What is your view on that? Yeah, it's a good question. And, uh, you know, even for us, right, to be very fair in our equation, you know, we have to go to companies and uh, charge them whatever it costs to collect and process a waste stream versus the value. And that's going to be a cost. We never go to a company and say, we'll pay you to collect and recycle this object, because if we did, it would already be curbside recyclable. And so we also have to work very hard on making sure this drives value for them. Does it help elevate their brand? Does it help if it's a retailer drive more foot traffic? The more other forms of value we can show, 
the more they can lean in because they start understanding it in the way they're motivated today, right? Which is market share uh, growth, you know, those sort of more uh, classic financial motivators. Now, uh, you know, the, the idea of greenwashing is an interesting one. I think the black and white uh, sort of, you know, line is easy to say if someone's putting out something that's false or highlighting something as relevant that was never relevant. Well, those are fundamentally bad, you know, bad and unethical practices, right? Um, you know, so if you say your product does not in, in contain now some nasty ingredient that it never contained, or you know, or or or, or just putting out things that are fully false, that's the black and white part. I think the gray part, which is which is interesting, and we have to be just careful on both sides, right? Of this, you know, uh, 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 is is usually any innovation, any idea starts small, and then it grows. So what we don't want to do is when a big company puts out a, a, a first step, which relative to its size will always be seen as very small to attack it saying, well, it's greenwashing because relative to your scale, it's a non-event. Mm -hmm. However, on the flip side, uh, uh, what, what, what we have to protect against is, is companies putting out pilots, getting big, huge publicity for them, and then they quietly go away or don't grow. And so it's about finding the sweet spot where we encourage companies to want to put out as many experiments as possible and learn, but then to hold them accountable to make sure that they're growing them. Uh, because there's a big challenge of many pilots getting launched, uh, getting huge publicity, and then fizzling away, and then they're replaced by the next high-profile pilot launch. Yeah, so it's interesting because you do want to hold um, companies accountable. And I would say, again, we want to hold uh, also politicians accountable. And I want to come back to just it's something that riffing off something you said, which is, you know, in some ways, um, so for example, if you think about the, the Biden administration and politicians in general, I don't think this is a partisan issue. Most people support efforts to clean up the environment. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we kind of had this discussion that the rise in fossil fuel prices is actually going to have a very salubrious effect on the environment. And yet politicians, when the people see the price go up at the pump, they get very mad at their politicians. Sure. And, you know, this is at the state level, federal level and the like. And, you know, how do we reconcile those views, if you will? And, you know, how do we get something that's akin? You know, I don't think people understand the relationship between public policy and saving the environment, to be yeah. perfectly frank. And I think you're touching here on perhaps the biggest and most important question in the entire sustainability movement. So first and foremost, the higher the price of oil, the better for the planet. Every turtle and seagull cheers on the price of high oil. And it's good because it makes things more expensive, which means we will buy and consume less. It's that simple, right? Um, it, is, it also even helps industries like recycling, because then recycled content becomes more competitive than virgin. But if you you know, one of the challenges of the sustainability movement is that it's incredibly complicated. And in fact, you could do some good here and create some bad over here, right? And then how many people can explain, like an average lay citizen, you know, walking the streets, how their shampoo bottle is connected to an orangutan not having habitat because of the palm oil inside? Do they even know that there's palm oil? And do they even know how that's affecting, you know, uh, a tropical rainforest and so on? And so it's incredibly complex. And that's a very big challenge because people can't take that type of information in and honor it. But there's one simple distilling factor that connects it all, which is we vote for environmental destruction by buying things, because we are then voting for farming, for mining, for transport, for all this gears of industry uh, to go. And business on its own can't solve it. It just can't because it has an infinite appetite for growth because, you know, it is there to be responsible for the profit given to its shareholders. I mean, that's the way business is taught, maximize profit to shareholders. And so... The, the big answer is going to end up being, I think, a cultural one, which is can we curb our appetite uh, and, and, uh, and buy less things, fundamentally less things, right? Now, you could take easy steps, buy use, buy more premium, whatever, but it has to be a fundamental lowering of net, net uh, consumption. And a good place for that to come is first and foremost citizens, so that citizens can then make that the cultural approach. And then have lawmakers be elected because lawmakers are going to end up passing populist legislation always anyway to just sort of the popular barometer and get then laws to be passed that help uh, help the country move in that uh, uh, direction. Now, it's easy to say, right, but the problem 
is that it's fundamentally anti-business, which is anti-capitalist, which is anti-American, right? Because America <laughs> is a business and it is very much, you know, you know, enshrined this idea of capitalism is the culture. And if, if I think this will be the big cultural debate of our time. Um, now, I'd conclude this sort of thought by saying, we're going to have to. There is just no question this will happen. It's either going to happen through phenomenal trauma, you know, the environment punching us in the face over and over, and all the fellow plants and animals, you know, that sort of co-inhabit with. Um, and then we're going to have to get there, right? Or, and this is the heart, can humanity sort of rise above that and be able to regulate on its own? But it's going to be painful because... You know, it's it's fundamentally saying let's uh, let's modulate, you know, uh, uh, sort of, you know, greed and growth and capitalism in some way. Yeah. And that that is a generational type change. Massive, and my yes. concern is that the urgency is so great that we're going to have to intercede even before we yeah. change that culture. I I know my my I was buying a new computer and my son said to me what are you going to do with the old computer and why do you need a new computer? And he belittled me and he was right actually for the waste that was associated with that. And I was never raised to do that calculus, but uh, I'm going to get a lot of nasty notes about my consumption patterns. So I'm going to move on. But I do want to say you did talk about raising the price of things, especially things that have these negative externalities. And I just want to say, so long as we don't buy it with Bitcoin, we're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, that raises all. Another. Right. Well, and just to build, though, by the way, there's different degrees of negative, but there is no good purchase. Right. Like it's not to say there's benevolent and evil purchases. Everything is a degree of some form of harm on the environment. Even, you know, I say this as a vegetarian, even the vegan burger that I buy. Yes, it's not beef and, you know, all the externalities that are locked up in beef, but it is still that farm could have been a forest, right? So there is, we, we shouldn't delude ourselves by thinking that there is a benevolent, you know, purchase and then there is evil purchases. There's just degree of harm. Mm -hmm. And we should, of course, lower that. Um, and uh, and I think that's the that's going to be the key. Now, the good news, you know, and this is sort of the, the silver lining of every one of these disasters, and we've measured this all over the world. Every time there's an environmental disaster, um, it is statistically relevant, the increase and maintained increase on that society's concern for the environment. It, 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 of course, goes up and then comes down a bit, but it, get, it always maintains at a higher point than before. Whether it's, you know, we saw this with Australia and their fires. We saw this with Fukushima in Japan. We saw this with, you know, even the United States. The, the, uh, uh, the uh, amount of concern people have for the environment has measurably increased over the past uh, two years. And so, um, uh, you know, it's coming, right? And it's a question is where will our self, you know, sort of regulation meet with the planet doing it for us. So actually that raises another issue because I know your family was affected by um, an environmental disaster. You left, as I understand it, you left Hungary, Hungary when you were young, right yes. after Chernobyl. Yes. Could you talk about how that shaped what you're doing? Absolutely. Yeah. So when I was uh, four uh, in 86, uh, Chernobyl happened, uh, which was, you know, relatively close to uh, where I was uh, living in Budapest in Hungary and it destabilized the borders. Uh, and uh, and it did that because no one would buy uh, produce, you know, like the lettuce, to, you know, tomatoes. No, there was no uh, markets because, of course, people were worried about fallout and contamination. And uh, that destabilized the borders, which is still under the Iron Curtain at the time. And we were able to leave as political refugees and then landed in you know, Germany, then Holland, then Belgium. And then at the age of seven, three years later, finally uh, was accepted in Canada. And that's where I ended up growing up and then just came down to the U.S. for, for college, which is where I am now. You know, for me, um, uh, it didn't really hit me because I was very young, right, at the time. Um, you know, the uh, Chernobyl from an environmental standpoint. But then especially in growing up in Canada, which has a really strong environmental sort of culture to it. Um, uh, it's something that, you know, really built a lot of passion for me. And I had, you know, my biggest turning point, honestly, I remember this first class at Princeton was Econ 101, you know, introduction to economics. And the professor gets up on stage and asks, what's the purpose of business? And to my disappointment, you know, although I was a little utopian, perhaps the answer she was looking for was maximize profit to shareholders. <laughs> and, uh, it, that was perhaps the biggest turning point because I fell in love with entrepreneurship many years before that, but I then really had this pivot to how do we do purposeful entrepreneurship, right? Uh, where it's purpose first and then do that in a, in a capitalist uh, context. 
Um, and that's been, you know, 20 years and I've, I, I would never start any company other than having something like that at its core. Um, uh, uh, and I think that all sort of came together in that journey, you know, from communism to capitalism, you know, uh, 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 you know, with those events in play. Okay. Well, I know we're, we're, at, uh, we've got about 15 minutes left and we're getting a lot of really interesting questions in the Q and A. I want to encourage people to submit them. And I, I want to share some of them with you. I'm going to yeah. paraphrase and combine, but I think, you know, again, thinking about the policy response, suppose we don't allow you to say consume less and recycle more. Yes. What do you see as the most important recommendations for, you know, in promoting sustainability? I think, the biggest first thing I, you know, I would say to anyone, and this is a this is something that I think anyone can use, whether they're a citizen or you know uh, 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 in any part of society, is what you buy is a vote. It's an active vote. In fact, probably more more important than a political vote because you're voting with money and you're doing so multiple times a day. It's a very pure. It's the most you know probably I think the most you know authentic. Uh, and, and real expression of democracy, right? Um, uh, mm -hmm. And then what are companies out there? They're not out there trying to convince us to buy crap we don't want. You know, it's so hard to do that. Why bother? It's instead much easier to figure out what we want and get it to us cheaply and affordably and in the most, you know, convenient way possible. And then if you're really genius at it, figure out what the consumer wants that they don't yet know they want, right? That's about, I think, as good as you can get. And so it, 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 it's, it's what we buy, more will appear tomorrow. What we don't buy is also an active vote because, you know, not voting is an active process as well. And less will appear tomorrow. And we have to take that seriously. I think as we just enter a store with that mentality in, in play, you don't have to know all the externalities of a product. But would you shop differently? And would you express that vote? Because right now, I think we're voting blindly, which is dangerous. Right? Can you imagine if we all went and did a political vote and just said we voted, but didn't look at who we voted for? Right. <laughs> it would be horrifying. But we're doing that with money, which is a more powerful vote constantly. And I think once we have that simple shift in our mentality, a lot of exciting things can come from that, right? And uh, noting, again, that buying is a vote, but not buying is an equal vote, right? It's, it's not that you can buy your way into sustainability. It's about how do you uh, deal with that, that vote uh, uh, and leverage it. And I think I would just leave it there to say that is perhaps the most powerful starting point. And that can be expressed in institutions and individuals alike. I would phrase that as capitalism can be democratizing in that sense. You know, yeah. you're, yeah. you're voting constantly. Yes. Um, and we could have a whole session on that. So uh, another issue that's come up is food waste. So yes. the example here is South Korea, which used to recycle just about 2% of its food waste, food waste. And according to um, this person, it's now 95%. Can you Talk a little bit about where we are in the United States on this and where we can go. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we also do operate uh, TerraCycle in South Korea. Um, so we've had a lot of uh, uh, great work out there. And it's actually really incredible to see in that region, you know, South Korea, Japan and other markets, how they've shifted meaningfully uh, you know, towards a circular economy. Um, no, food waste is a big issue, right? I mean, we throw out 50% of the food we grow and it comes in many aspects of the supply chain. It starts, you know, at, at, at the farm level where maybe we overproduce uh, certain, you know, crops and then uh, and, and they just end up rotting in gigantic fields and warehouses because there's too much supply. It could be um, the idea of imperfect fruit. You know, uh, if the banana is too small or too big, it never hits. It never gets to the market. Then, you know, the food that expires at the supermarket, the food that uh, is, you know, is not eaten at the restaurant, uh, the food that you get on your plate and you don't consume. There's all these steps and it adds up to 50% of food produced is, uh, is not consumed. I think the first part is how do we solve for that, right? How do we compress down from 50% of food produced uh, is thrown out to way less? And frankly, an unintuitive starting point is don't eat meat uh, uh, or fish or anything that's a higher trophic level because you have to feed 10 times the, like if, if you could feed 10 people on, let's say, vegetables and fruits, if that same material is fed to an animal, 
that animal would only sustain one person. Every time you move up in what's called the trophic level, you go down in, at, at, at a logarithmic uh, 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 unit of energy. So we can really compress the volume of, uh, of food waste by first eating a plant-based diet. I mean, think about how much farmland in America is dedicated to feeding animals. It's the vast majority, the vast majority, right? Um, then how do we compress in each of those steps from farm to production, you know, to, to, uh, to if it's a restaurant, you know, or a, or a manufacturer all the way to our table. Um, and there's lots of really exciting innovations, you know, out there. Uh, uh, there's lots of companies now looking at, you know, how do we monetize food that may have expired before throwing it out, sell it as day old, you know, these sort of examples, wonderful startups and that compresses that 50% down uh, 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 dramatically. And only then do you look at the third step, which is how do we make sure that that food waste doesn't end up in the landfill producing methane and leachate and all sorts of huge negative externalities, but is properly composted. And in the US, you know, unlike the example in Korea, only 4% of Americans have access to composting. It's incredibly low. And this is an infrastructure investment because if it was profitable to do all this composting, one would. So if we want composting to grow, we have to invest into it with our taxes and make it a priority in, in public spending. Thank you. And so, you know, we had a question about food waste. And uh, I think another question came up about batteries. Uh, yes. And, you know, obviously with the ink, and I don't want to say explosion of electric vehicles, because that's a loaded term. But yeah. uh, obviously, you know, these are very hazardous materials. How are we going to figure out what to do with the batteries when we're done with them? Uh, and what can what can we do on the private sector side and the public sector side here? Because they're enormously expensive to the environment. They are. They are. And, you know, this is a, there's a great quote or a great example uh, when uh, way a decade ago or even further when the Prius first came out, first sort of commercial hybrid. Um, when you look at the full life cycle of a Prius versus back then a Hummer, which was the big evil, you know, gas guzzling car, the Hummer came out better for the environment than the Prius. If you looked at the entire life cycle of producing the car and disposing the car, not just if you zoomed in and looked at the life cycle of mileage, you know, during the actual wow. driving time, the Prius, of course, did much better, used less fuel. But if you looked at then dealing with the making it and dealing with the vehicle at the end, uh, 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 it didn't look as good. And I think this has to do with how we. All right, I just saw 50 Prius owners hang up. There you go. Well, no, but it's but it's also what the Prius created a symbol. And the symbol is what I think brought out the entire electric car uh, movement, right? And electric vehicles, I think, are really smart. We just have to think about, and I mean, you know, the uh, uh, I drive an, uh, 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 an electric car as well. I think it's, it, it's a really smart step in the right direction, but we have to be eyes wide open to the question you asked. And the challenge is the way business is constructed, it's not in any way forced to design into what happens at the end of a product. Like the moment an electric vehicle hits its end of life, it is not the problem of the manufacturer. And if we want to solve this and any of these other sort of material externalities, we have to make it the problem of the manufacturer, right? And that has to be built in, that you must take, you know, uh, 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 the financial responsibility of having that object disposed and ideally recycled and, you know, so on and so forth. And uh, this is where the sharing economy we use is really set to win, uh, because in reuse models, sharing models, that externality is baked in. The manufacturer does have to take it back. And then what's amazing is all the design principles fundamentally change because, this, because of the knowledge that I have to deal with it when it comes back. And that really is an important role of legislation. I don't think that it's going to happen voluntarily or it will uh, happen very little, you know? Yeah. And I, again, you know, I don't, I, there, the, I think, you know, your point about personal responsibility, buying a used car, for example, in some ways is quite a noble gesture. And, you know, you see with the internal combustion engine, I, I'm curious about the cars that from the 90s and maybe even earlier that are still in existence in Central America, for example, or in Mexico, they've gone to other countries in some cases. And are they on net good or, but it also raises the question, and I did want that sustainability can have very different effects on economic equality and inequality in this yes. case. You know, and could you talk a little bit about how we kind of 
figure out so that it's not the case that, uh, you know, our pollution is being exported to other countries? Yeah. Um, it's got, it's a very, very good question. And in the world of waste, there's been a lot of uh, national based legislation that has focused on this. Famously, China banned the importation of waste. Uh, 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 they put up the green fence, then there was the green sword, a much more aggressive version of that. Um, that happened just a number of years ago. A number of other countries in the APAC region then followed suit and stopped the ability for, for folks to, to export waste. Now, just to be very fair, what was going on, right? Like it's, it's, uh, cause sometimes people say, oh, it was dumping of material. It wasn't quite that black and white. Basically what would happen is, a U.S. or a Western, you know, could be Auckland or it could have been Toronto. It could have been, you know, uh, London. A recycler is collecting all this material. You may notice many times, you know, your recycling system says put number one through seven plastic in the bin. The only two types of plastic in the U.S. that have markets and supply chains on them is number one and number two plastic, HDPE and PET. That's it. And by the way, only of clear and light colors as well to boot. Everything else, number one, two, three, four, five, six, different plastic identifiers. There's typically no markets in the U.S. for those. And number seven actually means we don't know what it's made from. It's the great unknown uh, marker. And so what recyclers used to do in, uh, 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 in, in the Western markets uh, or the developed markets would be a more appropriate way to put it, is take those and then sell them you know, to Chinese uh, manufacturers or other manufacturers in that, in that region who would buy them. So they were actually purchasing them willingly wanting to buy them, right? It, wasn't, uh, it was a sale. Um, but then the local manufacturer would basically sort out what it wanted, you know, the good stuff, and then the other chunk would then dispose, and because there's not strong lit regulations there uh, and very poor systems, um, it would many times be informally disposed. And especially if you go to countries like Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, you know, Laos and others, it would literally just be dumped in the natural environment because there weren't, there, there's not the systems, you know, out there to protect against that. And that's why I think smartly these bans came up. Australia, for example, just banned the exportation of waste. First country to do that, where mm -hmm. they went one step further and just said, we're not even going to allow anything to be exported from the country. Their hope is that's going to produce a lot of internal demand for local recycling uh, infrastructure. Now, in the short term, these effects were traumatic, really bad on, on uh, developed country recyclers. Many of them went bankrupt. Uh, and it was really difficult because you just lost literally 40% of your end markets overnight. And whether you said the exportation of waste is good or bad, that was where 40% of the revenue came from for a recycler in Pittsburgh or Dallas or you know, Vancouver. And, uh, 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 and so uh, it was had a short term, you know, big negative effect, but it did also then put the pressure on how do we boost uh, locally. And I think that spawned, you know, passing of, you know, very small EPR legislation so far in Maine and others. I mean, the U.S. is very anti-regulatory. So, you know, and regulation is really good for this topic. So the U.S. is very, very far behind, um, you know, but it's starting to come. Even in California, we just saw legislation signed by the governor what was it in uh, earlier this month uh, called SB 343 uh, is the name of that legislation, which puts a lot more pressure on how brands can communicate recycling. And, uh, and I think it's going to do a lot of good, uh, uh, even though it will be seen as short term pain, it's going to bring out the right pressure points so that people then can change and innovate as the consumer pressure mounts. Uh, okay, great. I have two in the time remaining I have two more yeah. questions. Um, the first is we have a lot of very publicly spirited students. They're very civic minded. They often go into government or nonprofits. But do you see opportunities for these individuals to who have this sense in the private sector? I do. I think, you know, what's so interesting about sustainability is that I've been doing this for 20 years. And 20 years ago, most companies didn't have a CSR function or you know, a sustainability department. Um, and there has been now increasing and really in the past five years, exponential investment into this field. In fact, a lot of companies, you know, I know organizations right now, you know, you know, like Walmart and others are challenged to find people to fill these sustainability roles because the roles are exploding, the need of the roles in volume, there's way more open jobs. And there's not the folks out there necessarily, you know, uh, ready to fill them. And so there's a huge and growing gap uh, between, um, you know, between uh, the uh, corporate's desires to lean in on CSR uh, and, uh, and people taking those roles. Now, I think if you are going to uh, look at the private sector, I think the first thing you should do in an organization is see where the sustainability department is housed. Is it, in some cases, it's a function of the legal department. That means the company sees it as a risk similar to corporate affairs or government relations, but how to, you know, it's, it's seen overtly as a risk then. Sometimes it's owned by marketing and communications. 
then it's seen as you know uh, something to do with reputation, right? And uh, uh, and sometimes it is its own uh, independent uh, function. It's really telling to see where it's housed. Don't go in blindly thinking all CSR is the same, and then look at how big and robust the department is, and ask if it has uh, budget, and if so, how much relative to the revenue of the company. And then finally, how much power can it exert? Can it force the company to do something that is anti-profit? Because look, in the end, any, any sustainability decision that's going to make the company more money, that's like low-hanging fruit. Don't give any credit to those. Those are like eco-efficiencies. Every company, if they're not stupid, should be doing those. The real questions are the difficult questions. Would it actually you know, uh, lower its short-term profit in exchange for doing the right thing. That is the real big one, right? And those are the ones you want to really uh, look for. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> that's really insightful. Um, okay, I'm going to conclude by asking you one final question, which is you get one regulation at the national level, yes. uh, one executive action, one law. What is it you want past is it that no one eats meat no or is no it no a carbon it's, tax or i i've got it, it goes back to our earlier point i would want to set the oil price as high as possible permanently like the opposite of subsidizing it make it brutally expensive yeah so there's been a per, one proposal you know one of the concerns by the way with that is it really harms people who have to commute long distances and this inequality but some have argued that you take all the revenue from taxing uh, gas, for example, and oil generally, and you give it back in a tax credit sure. to low-income people. Yeah. And so look, I, what I would say is I'm not, you know, that's not my expertise is what you just described. And I think most of the people here in this audience, it is their expertise, right? But but if if commuting gets more expensive, maybe there's, you know, different approaches to how to do those jobs, right? If uh, you know, if food gets expensive, you know, people will stop eating meat. I, if I moved oil up, I get my meat goal. <laughs> it, it's a part of that. It's all yep. connected. Yep. But if, if I move oil up, then recycling explodes. If I move oil up, uh, transportation reduces. You know what I mean? Everything starts moving in the right direction. I think oil is the center point to this, at least in my opinion. Excellent point. Uh, thank you for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. It's been really a fascinating conversation. Wish you all the best. And thank you to the audience for the questions and for listening. Take care, everyone. Thanks for having me.